Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study at Calvary Baptist Church. So glad you joined us here this evening. We will be continuing our study in the book of Hebrews this week. Today we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 9 verses 1 through 10. Uh, as we remember, the central theme in this part of the scripture is comparing the ministry of Jesus to the ministry of the Old Testament priests and the Old Testament sacrificial system. And we are going to be diving even farther into that system here this evening. And we're going to uncover a real way in which Jesus Christ's ministry so far is superior to the Old Testament covenant. And so we're going to see that as we begin our time together this evening. Uh, go ahead and open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9 as we begin to look at the scripture together. Starting in verse 1, the text says, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness, for a tent was prepared. The first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence. It is called the holy place. And so here the author of Hebrews begins to discuss the, the tabernacle that was set up in the days of Moses and during the time of their wandering through the desert. And in fact, this tabernacle was the central focus of worship for God's people all the way until King Solomon built the actual temple uh, in Jerusalem. And so this was a, a big part of worship. It is where all of the focus uh, remained. It's actually where the Jews would say that God's presence symbolically resided within the tabernacle itself. And so to understand what's happening here and to understand what's going on, we need to understand the tabernacle itself. Now, as you go back through Scripture, as you look in passages through Leviticus, as you look in passages in the book of Numbers, that's where we see a lot of description as far as the tabernacle, how it functioned, how it operates, uh, the, the way it was set up, the way it was torn down, and, and how it all functions. So if you're interested in that study, I encourage you, go back and look through the books of Leviticus, look through the book of Numbers, and just see what takes place there, because it is central to ancient ancient Jewish worship. For us here today, we're going to kind of hit the highlights of what that temple system was all about, or I'm sorry, what the tabernacle system was all about. And as you look at the tabernacle, what you would see is a large tent that was erected. It would have a, a large kind of tent cloth wall that they would put up around it, and then that would be the inner courtyard that you would see. It was still open to the air. That's where the actual sacrifices would take place. The priests had a, a basin of water. They had an altar where they would go and they would burn the sacrifices before the Lord. And that's where all, the, all of those activities took place. Uh, the priests would then go into the first section, the holy place. And inside this holy place, there were a few different items. Uh, there was what was called the bread of presence, would have, which would have been bread that was baked and changed out on a regular basis. Uh, and there were 12 loaves sitting there representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And the priests would actually consume this bread when it was time to switch it out. And there was this ceremonial bread reminding us of the presence and the provision of God. Uh, there was also the lampstand in, in this tent. And the lampstand that was in, pen, in the tabernacle had seven different flames that were lit on it, uh, representing the number of perfection. And it would cast light into the room. Uh, and that's what we would kind of see in, in this place. Uh, and the idea was is that it sent a very clear message to God's people that God was separated from them because of sin. In fact, when you look at the whole way the temple complex was set up, uh, it was set up depicting the fall and depicting the Garden of Eden. You know, as Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3, God cast them out of the garden, sending them away. And in front of the tree of life, he placed a cherubim with a flaming sword in order to keep them from coming back and eating from the tree of life. Well, as we look at the complex of the tabernacle, we see that it was arranged directionally so that people leaving the Holy of Holies would be heading out in the same direction Adam and Eve did as they left the garden. And so that's the first comparison we see. The second we see is that as you entered into the holy place, 
uh, not the Holy of Holies, but the holy place, you would be confronted with this massive curtain that would be hanging in front of you. And on that curtain would have been painted these cherubim and, and these big winged creatures that were guarding the Holy of Holies, just like a cherubim with a flaming sword was guarding the tree of life. And so every step uh, of this process was to remind the people of Israel that, hey, you're separated from God because of your sin. You know, a sacrifice would have to be made in the outer court. That blood would have to be brought into the holy place, and then the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies on one day a year in order to deliver that sacrifice. And so what we see here is that this is the temple complex that's being described in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. It talks about how this holy place and inside this holy place were the lampstand and the table of the bread of presence. But as we move beyond, we see that there is another room in the tabernacle complex. So you would walk into the, the holy place. There would be the curtain in front of you, and beyond that would be the holy of holies. And there are some special items in there as well, as we see in verse 3. The text says, Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense, and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. And so here we have a very brief description of the Holy of Holies. And so as you go past that curtain that was in the tabernacle, as you enter into the Holy of Holies, you would see a bowl of incense, an altar of incense that was sitting before the Ark of the Covenant. And then you would also see the Ark of the Covenant itself described in the book of Joshua, described in Leviticus, described in Numbers. The, the Israelites carried this Ark with them. Uh, it was a, a very ornate box laden with gold, and on top of it sat two cherubim, winged angels, and on the top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat, uh, which is actually the physical representation of God's presence right there. That's where they believe that God resided. And so what's happening with, with all these different items? What's happening with all these different details? Well, what we need to remember is that during this time period, uh, people believed, and in fact it was taught, that, that if you saw the face of God, that you would die, that you couldn't survive it. And that's true of us in our sinful state. You know, if we sinners stand before a holy God, we cannot survive his wrath. We cannot survive his glory. That's why in the Old Testament, you always see the Hebrews would be looking at Moses and saying, we don't want to go talk to God on Mount Sinai. We don't want to go enter into the temple. We don't want to go speak with him. You go for us. They were terrified as one should be when they stand in the presence of God. And so there's all kinds of different uh, ideas, there's all kinds of different procedures taking place to protect the people from the full-on presence of the Lord, one of which is the curtain. The curtain separates those from, from entering into the Holy of Holies. And even the high priest himself could only enter into the Holy of Holies one time per year on the Day of Atonement, the day of Yom Kippur. Uh, another interesting thing is that there was a second veil inside the Holy of Holies blocking off the Ark of the Covenant itself, again, protecting the high priest from seeing the full glory and the full manifestation of God. Another uh, procedure that was taken is this altar of incense. And the, the Hebrew priest, the high priest of the time, he would go into the Holy of Holies and he would lay this incense on the altar and burn it. And it would fill the Holy of Holies with this kind of smoke and this incense as it burned. Again, clouding your vision, preventing you from seeing the full force of God's glory. You cannot look at the Old Testament tabernacle without walking away understanding that human beings are separated from God because of their sin. And that's what we see taking place here. You know, the, the Ark of the Covenant itself, it held manna that was given to the people of Israel. It held Aaron's staff. And it also held the law, representing God's provision, the priesthood, and the law given to us. And so all of these items, very sacred, very holy, very special to the Jewish people. And, and again, 
emphasizing that point that a mediator must stand between God and man. The mediator this time is the high priest. And the interesting thing is, is as the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies, they were absolutely terrified to go before the Lord. They were terrified because, man, if you get the wrong day, God strikes you dead. If, if you go before the Lord in an unclean state, the Lord strikes you dead. It, it was a nerve-wracking thing to be the high priest and to go before the Lord on the day of Yom Kippur. So much so that in, in you know, later ancient Jewish uh, history and tradition, they would actually put bells on the coat and the robes of the high priest and they would tie a rope around their ankle so that that way if something happened to them, if they got the day wrong or if they weren't clean or if something took place and the high priest were to be stricken dead, well then that way they would hear the fall and they would be able to take the rope and pull him out without having to go in and fetch him. And so that's the idea and that's the understanding. Sin is a serious business. Sin is a deadly business. And we are separated from God because of our sin. And that's what we see taking place in all of this ritual and all of this pomp and circumstance and all these items taking place is to show us that true, clear fact. And so we get through this description of what's in the temple and we come into verse 6 and the text says, These preparations, having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. Now, we remember that this is the reason that the sacrificial system existed, was to atone for the sins of Israel. But there's two things that are very interesting about these few verses. Again, that the, the priest goes in for blood to make this, this, this sacrifice, to atone for these sins, but he has to atone for his own sins as well. See, the priesthood was not a perfect sacrifice, and therefore it had to be done over and over and over and over again. The other interesting thing, which I find a lot of people don't know when they look at the Old Testament, is that it says that they were making offerings for what? For himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. Now, this is a hard and true fact when looking at the Old Testament, is that the Old Testament system had no sacrifice for intentional premeditated sin. That's right. I mean, when you're looking at the Old Testament system, you, you don't see a place where, where a, a sin that was committed intentionally can be forgiven. In fact, if you look at Psalm 51, Psalm 51, this is the psalm that David writes after he is confronted by the prophet with his sin with Bathsheba. And in that psalm, he says that, Lord, you need to make me clean. You need to wipe me clean. He says, sacrifice you will not give. Sacrifice that you don't desire. If you desired, I would give it, but you desire a clean heart. Please give me a clean heart. In fact, when you go back in the scriptures and you look at the account of David and Bathsheba, he stands before the Lord and, and he doesn't make a sacrifice. He calls upon mercy from God because that's the only hope he has is that God would take mercy on him. David knew that there was no sacrifice that could cover the sin that he committed with Bathsheba and then the sin he committed by murdering her husband, Uriah. And we see this as we look through the Old Testament. If you go to Leviticus chapter 4, verse 2, it very clearly says that sin offerings are for the unintentional sins. If you go to Numbers chapter 15, I think in verse 22, it says again that it's the unintentional sin that, that was being offered for. And, and that's what you see in the Old Testament. You know, you're going down the road and you accidentally do something that makes you unclean or unholy, or you accidentally do something that, that, that is against God's law, then okay. But if you go out and you think to yourself, man, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway, there is no sacrifice for you. And you can just imagine the people of Israel going over and over and over again to the temple, offering their sacrifices. And you've got to think that in their minds was this thought saying, what about my intentional sin? What about the wrong I've done that I know that I did? Because there's no provision for that in the old covenant system. And that is why Jesus is so much better. Because Jesus doesn't just cover our sin that we commit unintentionally. He takes all of our sin. 
He forgives us of everything, every bad thought that we've had, every bad action that we have performed, every sinful piece of rebellion that resides in our heart. Jesus takes it all away because he is better than the Old Testament system that only accounted for the unintentional sin of Israel. Uh, moving on in this passage, we kind of see what is being, you know, another great fault of the Old Testament system. It says in verse 8, By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic of the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. And so here we see again two ideas that again point to the fact that the Old Testament sacrificial system, the system of the tabernacle and the system of the temple, is just insufficient. The first of all is that it shows that the way is closed. The priests can only enter into the outer court, into, into the holy place. The high priest can only enter into the holy of holies one day per year, and he was terrified in doing so. And so the author of Hebrews says, listen, that shows us that the way to God is still closed. The way to God and the way to be righteous in his sight, it hasn't been opened up yet. Not under the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. It's just, it's not there. And secondly, we see that these sacrifices that are being made, they can't perfect the conscience of the worshiper. See, it's all external. You go and you make your sacrifice. You do your, your washing. You do the things that you're supposed to do, but you still have a wicked heart. You still desire sin. You still desire rebellion. You still desire to go your own way rather than submit to God. And, and, and that's the problem of the sacrificial system. It doesn't change the heart, but we have a new system. We have a new covenant, not sealed with the sacrifice of animals, but sealed with the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and that is what we're going to be talking about next week as we go into verse 11. We begin discussing redemption through the blood of Christ. And so how wonderful it is and how thankful we are that we have Jesus Christ. We are not simply living, living day to day, trying to cover our sin. We don't have to worry about the intentional sin that we've committed because Jesus Christ has taken care of all of it. And I am so excited to jump into that part of the scripture with you guys next week. Thank you so much for being here. Hope you had a wonderful time. God bless.